Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good. And all the time, Psalm 100, verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I thank God that he's still on the throne despite all the confusion that's going on on this earth, the most recent one being the invasion of Ukraine. Remember to pray for the people in Ukraine. Just got a text from a friend of mine who lives in Germany and uh, highly distressed about what's going on in that part of the world. There's so many areas of distress and confusion and commotion that only those that are newsworthy make it to the television screens. But there's some that we don't hear about, but suffering is suffering whether it makes the television news or not. So always remember to pray for those who are suffering because among them are the people of God. Thank you very much for coming. Is there anyone present this evening who is with us for the very first time? May I see your hand? First time. Ah, would you give us your name? Uh, Kevin Mahalik. Kevin, how are you, brother Kevin? Nice to see you. Thank you very much for coming. Are you from McDonald? Uh, yeah. You are okay. All right. Say amen for Kevin. Amen. amen. Was a little weak and malnourished. Say it again. Amen. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> amen for brother Kevin. Nice to have you. May the Lord bless you endlessly, brother Kevin. Anybody else? First time. Anybody else? All right. Our subject for this evening, the other comforter. What did I say? The other. The other co what does that suggest? There's another one. It's not the one I'm going to talk about. Yes. The other comforter. Before I get into the message, please remember, as my good brother said before I came up, make sure your phones are turned off if you're not using them as Bibles so that we can worship God in a reverence. God will love that very much. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I'm speaking. What I want you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I really, as far as I can tell, want to speak God's words because they are life. And favor number three, think as you listen. Whenever someone is preaching or speaking to you, think. It is a tremendous risk to just open your mind and allow things to pour in indiscriminately. Think as you listen and the Spirit of God will bless that activity. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we come into your presence at your invitation Hebrews 4 verse 16, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. And so we come. We come seeking mercy. We come seeking forgiveness, dear God. We come seeking an outpouring of your spirit of truth. If we have sinned against you, forgive us, Father. Cleanse us, we pray. Remove all spots and stains and blemishes. Make us acceptable in your sight through Jesus Christ. Father, I humble myself before you. And I ask you, dear God, keep me conscious of the fact that my presence in this sacred desk is to lift you up by lifting up the truth. So I pray that you'd put your words in my mouth, your ideas in my mind, and the humility of Christ in my heart. Bless everyone listening, bless their families, place a double blessing on the children, I pray. Remember those suffering in Ukraine, dear God, both 
on both sides because war hurts both sides, the invading army and those invaded. So Father, be merciful, I pray, and hasten the coming of your son when all of this will come to an end. Bless those who are sick, I pray, particularly with COVID-19. Remove that affliction completely, dear God, and restore them to health. Now, Father, I humble myself before you. Speak through me, dear God, please, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Genesis chapter 1, reading from verse 1. Our subject, the other comforter. 636, I'll release you by no later than 715, perhaps before that. Genesis chapter 1, we'll read from verse 1. Do you have that? And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We are first introduced, or we are introduced to the Spirit of God, the first member of the Godhead mentioned by name. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It does not say Father, Son, or Holy Spirit. But in verse 2, the Spirit is introduced individually. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And so we know from this bit of information that the Holy Spirit was involved in creation in some form or fashion. It does not change the fact that the central figure of creation is Jesus Christ. But the Godhead always cooperate and work together. And so the Spirit is mentioned. The Spirit of God moved, or the proper translation would be hovered above the waters. The Spirit was present. All right. Now, we know from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth. We know from John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who is that Him? Verse 14 of John 1, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so that place is Christ right at verse 1 of Genesis 1, right where the Spirit is right there in verse 2. Now we know that Christ created for the Father. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9, and to make all men know what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. And so those verses permit us to locate Father, Son, and Holy Ghost at the creation. Brother Peter, you're supposed to slow me down. We, <laughs> all right, okay. And anybody else, I'm serious. When I go too fast, just say, Slow down, slow down. It's a habit I have found enormously difficult to break, but it's not a good habit. And so please say, slow down. And so we have the Spirit of God, Genesis 1 verse 2. We have the other members of the Godhead. All right. Now, having said that, I want us to go to John chapter 14. Our subject, the other comforter. John chapter 14, we we'll read from verse 16. And I want to recommend the book of John again, a lovely, lovely, blessed book. Please read it sometime and you'll get a closer view, a deeper view of Christ, particularly his relationship with the Father. John 14, reading from verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Let's look at some words in that verse. This presentation tonight is in some ways an extension of what we discussed at three o'clock. What was our subject at three o'clock? A close look at Christ. And our subject this evening, the other comforter. John 14, 16, let's read it microscopically. And I, who's that? Jesus Christ, will pray the Father. Two people. I will pray to the Father. Clearly, two individuals. And he shall give you another comforter. Another cannot be the same thing. Are you with me? This is a Bible. If I say give me another Bible, it cannot be this one. It has to be perhaps the one you have or the one you have. Another must include at least two. So Jesus says, and I, 
That's one personality. We'll pray to the Father. That's the second personality. And he shall give you another comforter. That's the third personality. So we have the Trinity in that one verse. If you will read it honestly. By the way, when Jesus says another comforter, it's because he is also a comforter. Amen. Are you with me? And so when we read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. It's the same word for comforter. In 1 John 2, verse 2, it is the Holy Spirit. In John 14, verse 16, is the Holy Spirit. But Jesus Christ is also the advocate and the comforter, just like the Spirit. And so when Christ said in John 14, 16, he shall give you another comforter, the Greek word for another is alos. There are two Greek words for another, alos and heteros. You see heteros in heterosexual. A heterosexual person is someone attracted to a person of another sex or gender. Alos means another of the same kind. So if I'm eating a banana and I say, give me another one of this kind, you'll bring me a banana, not an orange. When Jesus said, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter, the word another means another of the same kind. In other words, the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. I did not say the Holy Spirit is Jesus. I said the Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. That is why when someone has the Spirit, that is how a person has Christ. A person who has six has half a dozen. Are you with me? You're not? He who has six has half a dozen. He who has the Spirit of God has Christ. But since the Spirit of God is also called the Spirit of Christ in Romans chapter 8 verse 9, when you've got the Spirit, you have the Spirit of Christ, you have the Spirit of God, and the Spirit himself. We're focusing tonight on the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. But I wanted you to see that he's always in context of the other members, Father and Son. They always work together because they are a family. And when Jesus prayed in John 17, four times he said he wanted the Father to make the church one the way they are one. And you and I should do all we can to help that prayer get answered by not causing division in the church, but always trying to promote cooperation and oneness and peace so that we can contribute to the answer of the prayer of Jesus Christ and not frustrate that prayer. He prayed that the disciples would be one and you and I are those disciples. All right, let's, take, let's get into the business of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to John chapter 3. The other comforter is our subject. John chapter 3. We will read the words of Christ in verse 8 of John 3. Are you there? The Bible says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. Finish the verse. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Pause. When you read the words, born of the Spirit, what are those words describing? The clue is right there, born of the Spirit. Born again. Or some people call it the new birth. You may also call it conversion. You may also call it justification by faith. Listen to Christ. Notice whom he singles out as the active agent in that process. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. What did Jesus say to uh, Nicodemus in verse 3 of John 3? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot, what? See the kingdom of God. What did he say in verse 5? Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The new birth is activated by the spirit of God. Now, what is the new birth? Is the first step in what? 
Think of conversion. Remember that publican in Luke 18 who went up to the temple to pray with the Pharisee? The publican said in verse 13 of Luke 18, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said in verse 14, he went down to his house justified. That's the same thing in John 3, 8, born of the Spirit. That is the instant act of transforming a person. Making the person right with God, not only a right standing, but a right state. Are you with me? A right standing and a right state. Those two are accomplished instantly, then the process of preserving that is what we call justification. What I'm trying to tell you, the Spirit of God is involved in salvation very directly because the Spirit of God is divine. Only a God can effect salvation. Go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. The other comforter. The book of Isaiah. Another beautiful book to read. Isaiah 45. Let's read verse 22. Read very carefully and listen to the voice of God. Whenever you read the Bible, read it as if you're listening to the voice of God speaking to you. What does it say? Look unto me. And be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. All right. Listen to the words again. Look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, regardless of color, ethnic uh, identification, the, 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 the instrument of salvation is the same for each. For I am God and there is none else. What does he mean by there is none else? What does he tell people to look to him for? Salvation. What does he mean by there is none else? There's no one else that, ah, who can save? Go to verse 18. For thus said the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Finish the verse. I am the Lord and there is none else. Now, what's the central point of verse 18? Give me one word. Creation. Then what does he mean by I am the Lord and there is none else? There's no one else who can create. Now, in verse 18, no one else can create. In verse 22, no one else can save. Christ is savior or creator and Savior, but the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Amen. What is Psalm 104? Psalm 104, subject, the other comforter. Psalm 104. Now, this psalm is entirely about God working through in nature, nature fully dependent upon God. The animals look to God for food, for water, for whatever. They are dependent on God as verily as we are. It's a beautiful psalm. Read it sometime. Verse 29 tells us, thou hidest thy face, come on, their trouble. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Now read verse 30 for me. What does that say? Thou sendest forth thy spirit, come on, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. So we have the Holy Spirit connected directly to creation in some way, whether we understand or not. Now, whatever Christ can do, the spirit can do. Are you with me? Because they're both divine. They may have different offices, but the same power. You're looking at me a little cross-eyed. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are equally divine. But they have different responsibilities. Are you with me? The Spirit can represent Christ completely because whatever Christ can do, the Spirit can do. Is that clear? And so the Spirit is involved. The Spirit has the power to create. The Father has the power to create. The Son has the power to create. But the Son is the central figure. But the Spirit played a role. Now is that clear? All right. Which means the Spirit has to be divine. Only a divine being can create. 
Now, when God created, the sons of God shouted for joy. They watched. They did not participate. The angels watched. The unfallen worlds, their representative watched. They shouted for joy, but they had no role in creation because an angel, a created being, cannot create. All right. We're looking at the other comforter. Let me pray one more time, then we'll move on. Father, continue to speak through me because the subject I'm dealing with is the most sensitive. Hear this humble prayer. In Jesus' name I offer it. Amen. Go to Matthew 12. You just, hear, uh, you just heard me tell the Father I'm dealing with a sensitive subject. Matthew 12. The other comforter is our subject. I keep looking this way because so many are over here, but I need to uh, distribute my focus equally. It goes to show you how you can visually control a person's behavior. You put everyone over this side and one on that side, and the speaker does that. It's, it's just a, without even deciding, that's how you can control people by arranging. Okay, goes, there goes a handsome man. All right. Matthew chapter 12. Let's read from verse 31. Do you have that? All right. Read with me. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Keep reading. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Stop. You understand now why this is sensitive. We're dealing with the Holy Ghost. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit the Holy, shall not be forgiven. Now, verse 32. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Holy Ghost. Keep reading. Against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost. Finish the verse. It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Then you've got to be careful how you handle the subject of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost himself who's talking to us. Because he inspired the writings of the Bible. So he inspired Matthew to write, tell them, be careful how they deal with me. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man. Who is that? Jesus. It shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now let me add to what I said this morning. If you look at those two verses, Matthew 12, 31 and 32, clearly we have to have two separate individuals. You speak against the Son, you can be forgiven. You speak against the Holy Ghost, there's none. Two separate individuals. So Christ is not one person who expresses himself three different ways. There are three separate individuals. And the Bible tells us, here's the Holy Spirit, no forgiveness if you blaspheme him. You blaspheme the Son, there's forgiveness. By the way, to put your minds at ease, any sin you confess will be forgiven. Are you following me? But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit puts a person where he or she does not confess. And if it's not confessed, it's not forgiven. And the power that prompts us, that convicts us of our wrongdoing, is the Spirit of God. We learn this as early as Genesis 6 verse 3, where God said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. And I've said it repeatedly, the members of the Godhead have different functions. It is the Spirit of God that convicts a person of sin. If that conviction does not occur, there's no confession, no repentance, no salvation. And so we've got to be careful how we handle the Spirit of God. You blaspheme the Son, there's forgiveness. You blaspheme the Spirit, there is no forgiveness. That does not apply to an angel. The Spirit is a divine being. Let us go back to, let's go to 1 Corinthians 2. Before we go there, let's go to Job 11. We'll read 7 of Job 11. Job chapter 11, let's read verse 7, then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 2. Brother Job, just before Psalms, right after Esther, we have Job. You have Job chapter 11, reading verse 7. Read that with me. 
canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? What does that mean? No created being can plumb the depth of God. So I'm including human beings, angels, those on unfallen worlds. No created being can fully understand God. So Job says, canst thou by searching find out God? Notice the second part of that verse. Canst thou understand or find out the Almighty unto perfection? In other words, can you understand everything about God? The obvious answer is no. Why? Because God is unlimited. He's limitless. He's divine. But go to 1 Corinthians 2. Let's read 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 11. Let's read 9 to 11. You're familiar with part of that, I'm sure. Do we have that? Amen. But as it is written, what? I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Keep reading. But God hath revealed them to us. How? By his spirit. Now read carefully and microscopically. You read. For the spirit searcheth all things. Come on. Yea, the deep things of God. Now, we have searcheth all things. Remember Job 11 verse 7, canst thou by searching or examination, but the searching in verse uh, 10 of second verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 2 refers to a total understanding. There's an expression there that's very, very significant. The spirit searches all things, all things. The other significant expression is the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit understands everything about God. The Holy Spirit knows everything about God. The verse tells us clearly, he searches, he understands the deep things of God. First it says, all things, what are those things? The deep things of God. My brothers, my sisters, <clears throat> When the Holy Spirit makes intercession on your behalf and mine, Romans 8, 26, 27, he does that with the knowledge of the Father, which is complete. <coughs> Only a divine being can know everything that the Father knows. Only an intelligent being. There are some people who believe, someone told me once, the Holy Spirit is electricity or a force. I think that was the word, a force. A force is not an intelligent entity. Electricity does not think. Gravity does not think. The electromagnetic field does not think. They just act and react based on physical laws. The Holy Spirit is a thinking entity. Go to Acts chapter 13 with me. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, the other comforter. Acts chapter 13, reading from verse 1. Excuse me. Do you have that? Now there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon. That was called what? Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, whom we know as Paul. Five distinguished teachers and prophets at the church in Antioch. Antioch was the source of truth. Alexandria was the source of false teaching. As they ministered unto the Lord and what? Fasted. Read with me now. The Holy Ghost said. Stop. That tells you immediately we're dealing with an intelligent entity. I've heard, I've heard, uh, I've never heard electricity speak. I've heard it crackle, but I've never heard it speak. Are you with me? It does not speak. To speak, you must come from a source of knowledge and intelligence. The Holy Ghost said, what did the Holy Ghost say? Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, keep reading, for the work whereunto I have called them. The Holy Ghost discriminated among five people, Barnabas, 
Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, and Saul. And examining the five, he selects two best suited to carry out the task for which he called them. And when they laid their hands on them and prayed, they sent them away. And they being sent forth by, read verse 4 for me, and they being what? Sent forth how? By the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost sent Paul and Barnabas on a mission. The Holy Spirit of God is not a force. He's not energy. The Spirit of God is an intelligent entity as verily as is the Father and the Son. Because a force cannot represent the character of Christ. Are you with me? In order for the comforter to be just like Christ, he must be just like Christ. Remember Christ prayed, I or said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And he goes on to say, even the spirit of truth. To speak truth and teach truth, you have to be an intelligent entity. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Then Jesus says, I will not leave you comfortless. In verse 16, he says, the Father will send you another comforter. Jesus says in 18, I will not leave you comfortless. He says, I will come to you. How? In the person of the Holy Spirit, who perfectly and fully represents Christ. The Holy Spirit is an intelligent personality, as is the Father and the Son. Here is another reason why we should not offend the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. Our subject, the other comforter. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> We read 7 to 9, then we read from 14 onward. You have Romans 8 from 7. Father in heaven, continue to be with me. I appeal to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now pick up nine with me, but ye are what? Not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Hmm. Pause, think. Without the presence of the spirit in you and me, we cannot be identified as a child of God. Who wants to offend the spirit whose presence marks us as a child of God? If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The presence of the spirit is the identifying mark that you or I am a child of God because the spirit represents Jesus Christ himself. Let's go to verse 14 of Romans 8. What does that say? For as many as are led by the Spirit of, they are the... Now, what do you understand by led by the Spirit of God? Directed, instructed, guided. Electricity does not do that. Energy does not do that. Remember, it was the Holy Ghost who chose Barnabas and Saul and directed their travels and directed their mission. This was an, is an intelligent personality. For as many as are led, directed, their lives are led by the Spirit of God. Keep this in mind and just listen to Romans 8 from verse 1. There's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life, <laughs> he is called what? The spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We live by the direction and the guidance of the spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to anyone whose life is directed by the Spirit. We've discovered blasphemy against the Spirit of God is not forgiven. We've discovered the Holy Spirit is just like Christ. When you've got the Holy Spirit, you're filled with Christ. Because Christ is still human and divine, and he's restricted by his humanity. He's still God. I, I did not say he lost his omnipresence. He's laid it aside. Because of that, he cannot be everywhere at the same time. He's represented perfectly by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, blaspheme him, no forgiveness. He represents Christ. If he's not present in you, you're not identified as a child of God. We need the Holy Spirit of God. Can somebody say amen? Amen. The Spirit of God knows everything God knows. <laughs> ah, if there's one thing, go to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Do you have that? <clears throat> Not yet? I'll wait. Oh, you have it. All right. <laughs> Matthew 7. Let's go to verse 11. Brother Matthew, the former tax collector, publican, met Christ. His life changed completely. He wrote the first gospel. Matthew 7, verse 11. What does that say? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask? Now, we have good things, good gifts. You see those two expressions? Good things, good gifts. That's what Matthew says. Now notice again, Matthew says, If ye then being, if sinful parents, know how to give good things to their children, what about a sinless God? Will he not know what to give his children? The answer is yes. But Matthew does not specify. He simply says good things. Luke specifies. Go to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. You have that? All right, verse 13. Luke 11, verse 13. Are we there? Let's read the words written by the medical doctor Luke. If ye then being evil. In other words, Luke is writing what Matthew wrote, but he just tweaks the, ver the wording. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father, finish the verse. Ah, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Now, in Matthew, we have good things. Are you with me? Matthew said God has a lot of good things. Luke picks out the best. <laughs> ah, you're not with me. Are you with me? He picks out the best. And he says, look, your father has a warehouse of good things. Hmm? Here's the one to ask for first. The Holy Spirit. There is no other gift you can ask God that supersedes the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because when this, let, let me show you why again. Go to John 16. John 16, let's read from 13 of John 16, our subject, the other comforters, nine minutes after seven. John 16, reading from verse 13. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Read verse 40 now. He shall do what? Glorify he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Keep reading. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall do what? Take of mine and shall. Mm -hmm. How many things does the Father own? How many things does Jesus own? Everything. Go to John 17. Let's read verse 9 and verse 10. Read with me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are 
thine. Keep reading now. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Everything the Father has belongs to Jesus. Now, Jesus says in John 16, 14, and 15, the Holy Spirit is in charge of that. Who gives the gifts of the Spirit? I just told you. Who gives the gifts of the Spirit? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. <laughs> there is a beautiful analogy in the, uh, the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Eliezer, and Rebekah. You know those four characters? In Genesis 24, we don't need to go there, Abraham sent Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac. We know Abraham. There are two only begotten sons in the Bible. Name them. Jesus and Isaac. Let's go to Genesis. You look at me as though you're sleeping with your eyes open. Let's go to Genesis 24. Not 24, sorry, 22. Let's read from verse 1 of Genesis 22. Our subject, the other comforter, we're trying to stress the central role of the Holy Spirit, an intelligent being fully divine. Genesis 22, reading from verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, what? Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Stop. How many sons did Abraham have at that point? Two. Two. Name them, the first one. Ishmael, the second one, Isaac. But what does God say? Take now thy son, thine only son. He's the begotten son. Now, go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. God can count. He knew he had two. But God is not so focused on quantity. He's focused on quality. He wants the son of faith, and Ishmael was not a child of faith. He was a child of works. Do you have Hebrews 11? Let's read from verse 17. What does that say? By faith, come on. Abraham, when he was tried, offered up. Yes. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Because Isaac represents Christ. Are you following me? So who does Abraham represent? God the Father, yes. God gave his only begotten son. Isaac, uh, Abraham gave his only begotten son. Now, Abraham represents God. Isaac represents Jesus. Go to John 6, 4 to 4. Are you there? Read with me. No man can come to me except the Father which have sent me draw him now. What power does the Father use to draw people? The Holy Spirit. We know that. Jesus said no one can come to me except the Father draw that person. And the drawing power is the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to Abraham. Abraham sent whom? Eliezer. To do what? To draw Rebekah to whom? To Isaac. If Abraham represents the father, Isaac represents Jesus, whom does Rebekah represent? The church. Then identify Eliezer. The The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He had to select someone for Isaac. Represents the Holy Spirit. Are you following me? God the father, Isaac, Eliezer, Rebecca. So we see all the members of the Godhead working for the salvation of the church, the church being Rebecca, whom had known no man. The Bible says, God wants a church without, uh huh, and without, yes, indeed, spot or without blemish. So we have the Holy Spirit involved in selecting now. The Spirit cannot force you, but he comes to you and he woos you and he woos you. Now it's up to you or to me to resist because they resisted in the days of Noah. And we know what happened. They resisted in the days of Lot because the Spirit worked through Lot to appeal to his brothers-in-law, to his sons-in-law, Genesis 19, verse 14, and they laughed at him. The Spirit is appealing today. And some people laugh at him. Of course, the Spirit of God will have the last laugh, and we know that. 
I'm trying to tell you that the Spirit of God is an intelligent being. He is divine. He's all-powerful. He represents the Son and the Father. Without the Spirit of God, no one can be identified as a child of God. We read in Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, go to verse 16 of Romans 8. <clears throat> Let's combine that with verse 14. Romans 8, verse 16, let's add it to verse 14, which we already read. What does verse 16 say of Romans 8? The Spirit, come on, itself beareth witness that our spirit, that we are what? The children of God. That simply amplifies what we read in verse 14. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. To be led is to be directed, and that direction is the word of God. Because the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Spirit leads us through the word because the word is spirit-filled. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The other comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, who represents the Father and the Son. Christ went back, the Spirit took over the work. If you read Acts, the book of Acts is really a story about the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. You want to know about the Father, someone told me once, read the Gospels because Christ came to do what? Represent the Father. If you want to learn about Christ, you read the Old Testament. <laughs> Let me say that again. In the Gospels, Christ's mission was to represent. This is the Father. This is the Father. When he healed, this is the Father. When he raised the dead, this is the Father. When he opened the eyes of the blind, this is the Father. The Father is the figure in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Christ in the Old. But each one is just like the other. The other comforter. I want to put a challenge to you. I'll put it. I put it wherever I go. It'll scare you, but here's it. here it is. Take three weeks and only pray, finish my words, for the Holy Spirit. Don't pray for tuition. Don't pray for a boyfriend or girlfriend. Don't pray for high marks on your physics exam. If you study hard, you'll get it. Pray for the Holy Spirit. But also pray for forgiveness of sins, just for you. Now, if you're praying for someone else, you can say, Lord, give them a house, give them a land, give them a car and a boat and a submarine. You can pray all of that for somebody else, but for you, for Holy Spirit and forgiveness of sins, even if you're not aware of having done something wrong. Are you following me? Because we sin unconsciously. Now you may say, Psh, but I'm sick. I ought to pray for healing. The Bible says when the Spirit comes, he brings the things of Jesus. What you need to understand, when you have the Spirit, you have the manager of the storehouse of God. The Bible says, the Bible does not say we are identified as God's children if we have a big house. We are identified if we have the Spirit. But God bless you if you have a big house. Don't misunderstand me. Take three weeks. And only pray for the Spirit plus forgiveness. No matter what other needs you have, pray for this and see what happens in your lives. Let me give you a couple of stories. I'll let you go at seven, almost 7.20. I preached this somewhere in uh, some country in Africa. And I made the same appeal. About six weeks later, I got an email from a lady. She said, Elder Skeet, I did what you said. I prayed for the Spirit. And within six weeks, she said, that was your six or four weeks, all my debts were taken care of. No, I'm not saying that's how God blesses everybody. I'm not saying that. Are you following me? All right. I did the same thing in Indonesia. A young lady wrote me, I want you to know that I did what you recommended. And after three weeks of praying only for the Spirit, I am a different person. And that's a, a teenager saying that. 
I am a different person. Someone wrote me from some other place. I heard what the Spirit did for that lady who got all her debts canceled. Uh, how can I do the same thing? <laughs> So I said, but the spirit works differently. Whether your debts are canceled or not, your spiritual debts will be canceled. Amen. My brothers and sisters, what you and I need today more than anything else is the spirit of God. The spirit of truth. The spirit of grace. The spirit of life. The spirit of God. And the spirit of Christ. Blaspheme him. There's no forgiveness. Without his power, there's no conviction of sin. Without his work on the mind, there is no comprehension of deep truth. We need the spirit of God at any age, on all ages. And so tonight, I heavily recommend to you the other comforter. Why other? Because other means another of the same kind. He or she who has the spirit of God has God. He or she who has the spirit of Christ has Christ because the spirit represents both. I won't ask for a show of hands as to who will take on that challenge. I won't do that. I'll leave it to you. But how many will say, Lord, I need more of your spirit? At least will you say that? May I see your hand? All right, hands down. God is a God who confirms. He gave two dreams to Pharaoh and Joseph explained the second dream was to show that God was confirming that what he said would happen. So let me confirm with you. How many of you will say, Father, I need more of your spirit. Let me see your hands again. Hands down, heads bowed, eyes closed. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. When studied here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, the word is simple as it deals with the essentials of salvation. We thank you, dear God, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you that as a divine being, he knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10. Father, it was he who spoke through the ancient prophets so that Enoch, who lived in the days of Adam, could predict the third coming of Jesus Christ thousands of years in the future. Why? The Spirit showed it to him. We need your Spirit, dear God. We know from Genesis 6 verse 3, he will not always strive or convict sinners. And so, Father, let us take today as the best day to ask for your spirit. Let the spirit open our eyes, show us our weaknesses, show us where we need to grow in grace, show us where we need to apologize, show us where we need to forgive, dear God, show us where we need to take more time studying your word, give more time in service to the gospel. Let the spirit guide and direct us, Father. Because it was he who guided and directed Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, thank you for the spirit. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for you. As we leave, let us leave filled with the spirit and surrounded by the mighty angels. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our promise is all. It stands as the sun. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast till I come. Hello and welcome to Gospel Ministries International. My name is Brantley Greenlaw and with us this week and today is a guest speaker. His name is Elder Randy Skeet. Randy, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. We have enjoyed so far the recordings that um, have, been, have been conducted at the Village Chapel. And today we have a special session with him, uh, question and answers that people have been asking uh, and, and these are important questions for each one of us to hear and to understand. Uh, but before we begin, Elder Skeet, would you offer a word of prayer? Surely. Our Father in heaven, we need your wisdom to speak accurately about what your word says. 
You've promised in James 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Grant us that wisdom, I pray, that the truth might be made plain and simple. Bless all those who are listening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Without further ado, let's, let's get into some of these questions. Um, the first one is, um, what happens to a man's spirit after he dies? What happens to man's spirit after he dies is a very, very important question. If you look at the way man was created, mankind, Genesis 2 verse 7, the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so the physical material was from the ground, and then God breathed life into that person. And some people call that life the spirit or the breath. That's fine. In Genesis 3, verse 17, when God addressed Adam after he had sinned, God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, God tells Adam, you'll go back to the dust. And so the physical part of a person goes to the dust, but the breath, the life, the spirit goes back to God. Because verse 7 of chapter 2 tells us, God formed him from the dust of the ground. That's from the earth. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And so we have the physical material from the earth, but we have the breath from above. So at death, the breath goes back to its origin, which is God. You can call it the life. The physical material decomposes and becomes dirt again. Now, what goes back to God is not a living spirit that floats around like a ghost. It is simply whatever God breathed into him goes back to God. Simple as that. Speaking of death, uh, people have a fear of death. Mm -hmm. And so the question uh, is asked, how do I know if I'm going to be saved? That's a very, very, very important question. How do I know? You know you'll be saved if your life is given to Christ 100%. Let me say that again. Your certainty of salvation is based on this one. Christ is able to save you. Two, you have given your life to him entirely so that he might save you. Christ cannot save the life that is not given to him. If you've given your life to Christ, and this becomes the pattern of your life, continual surrender to Christ, you will be saved whether you feel like it or not. Because salvation is not based on how you feel. It is based on the fact that Christ is able to save you. There is salvation only in Christ. He is the foundation on which our salvation is based. If you have given your life, and I repeat, entirely to Christ. You've given your life to someone who is more than able to save you. So the assurance of your salvation lies not in you, but it lies in what Jesus Christ can do. He's able to save to the uttermost those who come unto him by faith. And faith requires total surrender. And that surrender must be a way of life. Every day you surrender your life to Christ. The fact that he can save is your assurance of your salvation. Another question that people have is, um, okay, that's wonderful, but they say, I'm a good person. Uh, I'm not into drugs. I don't hurt people. I care about people. Why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to participate in this process mm -hmm. of being with other people? Again, <laughs> these questions are excellent. Jesus told Peter in Matthew 16, I think 18 and 19, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Jesus Christ has a church. So when you are saved, Christ leads you to his church. In Acts 7, 37, 38, when Stephen preached a very powerful sermon, he said Moses was with the church in the wilderness, God called the Israelites out of Egypt and formed them into a nation church. Now, why do I say that? 
In Exodus 19, reading from verse 4, the Bible says, Ye have seen what I did unto Egypt, unto Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God brought the Israelites out, and at the base of Sinai, he incorporated them into a nation church. The entire nation was a church, and the church was a nation. And so God said, if you obey me, I will make you a holy nation. And a holy nation is one that practices holiness seven days a week, not only on Sabbath. And so the concept of church is very, very important because the church on earth is founded by Christ and the constitution of that church, he issued at Sinai his 10 commandments. And so Jesus says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. In Acts chapter 9, when Christ met Saul on the road to Damascus and he knocked him off his horse, Saul said to him, and Saul later became Paul, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And Jesus said, go into the city and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Christ sent Paul to the church at Antioch and the church told Paul what he should do because the church had the authority to speak for Christ. Christ could have told Paul right there on the ground what he ought to do, but Christ wanted Paul to understand, I have a group on this church that speaks with authority because they say what I say. And so Jesus sent Paul to the church and the church told him what he ought to do. It is important to be in church not any church, it's important to be in the church that obeys and recognizes the authority of God. Being in church is absolutely important because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may, he may, he may devour. In the natural world, a lion or a cheetah or a leopard, when they choose prey, they try to isolate an animal from the herd. Once the animal is isolated, it becomes more susceptible to being attacked. This happens spiritually. You probably have felt this way in church, surrounded by fellow believers who are praying and singing and doing whatever else. There's a feeling of strength. When you are by yourself, the feeling is slightly different. Christ has a church and it is important to be part of that church. It is dangerous to just serve God on your own in an isolated circumstance. That puts you in spiritual peril. It is important to be part of the church body. Okay, the next question says, mm -hmm. but I'm young mm -hmm. and I want to be with my friends. Why do I need to go to church? I can be with my friends. Aren't they my church? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I get older, I'll go ahead and go to church like everybody else. Mm -hmm. well, now, that is based on the fact that you will live long. You see, there's no guarantee of long life. The Bible says, remember now thy creator in the days of the youth, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1. Who is the creator? Jesus Christ. So the Bible tells you, remember Christ your Savior when you were young. And Jesus Christ says, I have a church. Now, if you're concerned about your friends, your friends, the, the friends you should have are friends who are part of your spiritual life. In other words, friends in the church. Because friends in the church are more likely, I say more likely, to influence you the right way. And so, yes, youth like their friends, but all the people such as I, we also like our friends. But your friends primarily should be members of your spiritual community. And let me stress again, Jesus Christ has a church, and that is where you ought to be. That is where your friends should come from. So being young does not disqualify you for being a member of the church. Timothy in the Bible, Bible scholars believe he was a teenager when he began to assist Paul and he began to lead churches. As a teenager, Timothy led churches. One of the safest places, if not the safest places for a young person is the church. But I must stress, a church that recognizes the authority of Christ and obeys him. The next question that we have is, one where uh, it's objective or subjective. In other words, um, what is true for you may not be true for me. Mm -hmm. So why should I listen to your version of the truth when I don't 
I either don't want to or I don't think that your version of the truth is relevant. So how do you, how do you answer that question? That's a common modern problem. I suspect it also existed in ages past. The Bible tells us what truth is. When Jesus prayed to his father in John 17, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. For the Christian, this is the source of truth. This is the, 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 the fountain to which you go to drink the words of life, and the words of life are the words of truth. We cannot have each person deciding what is truth. That leads to the condition you read about in the book of Judges, where every man did that which was right in his own eyes. God does not permit that. God has a standard of truth, and that standard is his word. As a matter of fact, the truth is so important to God that Jesus Christ himself is called the truth. He is called the word of God, Revelation 19:13. His name is called the word of God, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. 1 John 5, verse 6, the Holy Spirit is truth. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4, the Father is truth. We have the Father is truth, the Son is truth, the Holy Spirit is truth. And what is that truth? The word of God. My listening friend, regardless of your age, it is not acceptable to God that everyone decides what is truth. You know, people do that with the Sabbath. I'll worship on Sunday. I'll worship on Tuesday. I'll worship on Wednesday. The truth of God says the seventh day. God has decided what is truth. And he has put that information in his holy word. If you want to discover what is truth, you go to the source of truth. Thy word is truth, and it is only by the truth that you're sanctified. You see, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Well, if you have one truth, I have another, he has another, she has another, which one has the sanctifying effect? It is that which is found in the word of God, which is the truth that sanctifies and saves, which is the truth that is personified in the very life of Jesus Christ. All right, thank you for that. The, the next question has to do with uh, the day of the week that you worship. So mm -hmm. the question is, is, I don't see any difference between worshiping on Saturday or Sunday. So why should it matter what day that I worship on? It matters what day I worship on because it matters to God. You see, what matters to God should matter to me. As early as Genesis chapter 2, let's read from verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. As early as Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 to 3, we're told three times that the Sabbath is the seventh day. It is God's day. Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And the reason why I cannot change it, it is not my day. It is God's day, and God chose the seventh. I have no authority to tell God he chose incorrectly. The reason why the day matters is because it matters to God. And God chose the seventh day, and that is Saturday. The seventh day is the Sabbath, regardless of how I feel about Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday. There's one day God has blessed, one day he's hallowed, one day he's sanctified, that is the seventh day, and he made that clear to Adam and Eve even before there was sin. The seventh day is the Sabbath. This is God's choice, and if God is my God and I obey him, I make his choice my choice. I don't offer recommendations to God. I submit to the will of God. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, and God has never, ever chosen any other day and will never choose any other day because he said, I will not alter the thing that is gone out of my mouth. And he said from his mouth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is the seventh day back then, now, and always will be. That's God's will. Make God's will your will, and your life will be blessed. The next question, though, says, <clears throat> uh, the people at the Sunday churches are nicer 
than the Saturday churches. So why should I go to a Saturday church? <laughs> They're nicer on Sunday. Ah, that made me smile. I don't know how anyone can prove that people in Sunday churches or Wednesday churches are nicer than those in Sabbath churches. It's not, it is not based on how nice you are. It is based on what does God say. Jesus said in John 6 verse 70, listen carefully. This is Jesus speaking. Have I not chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. There was a devil among the disciples. His name is well known, Judas. Jesus was the pastor of that early church. One of his members was a devil. Now, if Jesus can have a devil in his congregation and he was the pastor, surely modern congregations can have devils. It is not how nice the members are. The reason to choose a church is what does the church teach? And so in John 6, Verse 66, the Bible says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Verse 67, then said Jesus to the 12, will ye also go away? Peter said in the next verse, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter tells Christ, we're not leaving you, we're staying. Why? Because of what you're preaching. It is the preaching of truth that should attract you to a church, not how nice the members are. Let me repeat. Jesus said in John 6, 70, have I not chosen you 12? One of you is a devil. All churches have well-dressed, attractive devils, but that should not discourage you. The reason for choosing a church as it preached the truth. Jesus taught the truth. One member was a devil. Do not avoid the church of God simply because there are some devilish people in that church. You choose a church based on what it teaches, not on how nice the members are, how lovely the church looks, or how handsome the pastor is, based on thus saith the Lord. And if more people would do that, we would not have tragedies like Jonestown and Waco, Texas, where people followed somebody and they ended up losing their lives. You follow, thus saith the Lord. We need to give the climate a, a break. The climate? The climate. Mm -hmm. We need to give the climate a break is the next question. And since the majority of the world worships on Sunday, mm -hmm. why not make a law that everybody should take off on Sunday? We don't need to give the climate a break. We need to give God a break from all the disobedience we inflict upon him. That's whom we need to give a break to, to God. We torture God with con continuous disobedience and human reasoning. That's the person who needs a break. We are given six days to work, one day to rest. If we would follow God's prescription, the climate would be just fine. But let me also say, because of sin, the climate will get worse and worse because anything cursed by sin gradually deteriorates. It may take thousands of years, but let me say it again, anything cursed by sin inevitably deteriorates over time. And so the climate will get worse and worse. That's not a reason to disregard our environment, not at all. Because when God made Adam, he gave him dominion over the world. He had to take care of it. God made the trees, he made the animals. He wants us to care for our environment. But the reason why God will make a new heaven and a new earth, um, Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, verse 22, Revelation 21, verse 1. He has to make a new heaven and a new earth because the first one and this heaven and the first earth, because of sin, they are deteriorating. And so it is not whether we take a day to take care of the climate. If the climate deteriorates or not, we are to observe the Sabbath of the Lord. And that day, I say, is the seventh day, not Sunday the first, let me be bold but respectful. The first day of the week has never been the Sabbath of God. Now it is very nice we want to honor the resurrection of God, that's fine. He does not call us to do that by observing a day. We honor his resurrection by the foot washing ceremony, or I should say the, uh, the, the supper, you see, where he said as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death until he come. You wanna honor, the, you wanna uh, do something for the climate? Obey God, and obedience has benefits across the spectrum of existence. So anyone who sets aside Sunday as a day to honor the, the, the climate is acting in violation of God's word. God has given us one day regardless of the climate. 
Because when God gave that day, there were no climate issues. And that day is the seventh day of the week, Saturday, the Sabbath. Let us give God a break by ceasing all our disobedience. The problem is not the climate. The problem is continual sin against God through disobedience. The next question. Many of the religious world and probably a lot of the non-religious world has heard of something called the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. There's the number 666, that kind of thing. So the question is, is what really is the mark of the beast? In order to answer that question in a very simple way, the beast is opposed to God. You follow me? Identify the mark of God and you can reasonably identify the mark of the beast. Now, the Bible tells us in Exodus 31, uh, verse 13, in Ezekiel 20, verse 12, and 20, verse 20, that I have given them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me. God has said the sign or the mark, because in the Hebrew, sign, mark, token are all translations of the same word. So God has a mark. God has a sign. God has a token. That is the seventh-day Sabbath. God has said, I have given it as a sign that you're my people. It's a sign between God and his people, not God and the whole world, between God and his people, those who choose to obey God. The mark of the beast, and this you find this in a Catholic literature, Sunday, they say, is the mark of their authority because the church said it has the authority to change the law of God. Sunday observance is theoretically the mark of the beast. Why do I say theoretically? Because until now, there is no legal requirement to observe Sunday as a day of worship. And so Sunday is theoretically the mark of the beast. When a law is passed requiring Sunday as the day of worship, those who obey that law will then have the mark of the beast because they would have chosen to, uh, to obey man instead of God. The mark of God is a seventh day Sabbath. The mark of the beast is the observance of any other day beside the seventh day Sabbath. And the most popular day that competes with the Sabbath is Sunday. So the mark of the beast you've identified, but who then is the beast? The beast. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now you're getting me into trouble, but that's good. <laughs> it's okay. If you look at the writings of all the reformers, go back as far as even before the reformers. Now, the beast that my brothers refer or you're referring to is uh, mentioned in Revelation 13 under the leopard-like beast. That beast is mentioned in Daniel 7, and it is called uh, the, 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 the horn, the little horn. It's also mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2, called the man of sin. So it has all these things. Essentially, it is a power that opposes God. It is a religious system that opposes God. That's what makes it so astonishing that most of the world have not recognized the beast because no one expects a religious organization to oppose God. You see, it is astonishing. Not a church opposing God, but the beast is a religious organization. And careful study of the Bible will show you that the beast is the papal system. This has been discovered by Bible study by Luther, by Calvin, by the Wesley brothers, by Knox. You go back and study the history. They have all identified the papal system as the beast. It is that system that legalized Sunday as the day of worship and criminalized Sabbath keeping. The beast is the papal system. I did not say the beast refers to ordinary members in the pew. I am saying the beast is that papal system that purports or claims to have the authority to change God's law. And that conclusion has been, was arrived at hundreds of hundreds of years ago. As a matter of fact, that system at one point even banned the Bible. You could lose your life by having a Bible. It was not the government who did that. It was a religious system, I say again. It was a religious system that said, crucify Jesus Christ. The Romans said, let him go. The secular power said, let him go. A religious system said, kill him. Let me say again to you, my listening friend, the beast power mentioned in Revelation 13, Daniel 7, 2 Thessalonians 2 is a religious system and Bible study will show you that system is the papal system or the Roman system. 
Are we really living in the time of the end? Or is this just an era that we're going through? We are living in the time of the end. Now, if you read Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, you'll find all the signs that point to the fact that Christ is soon to come. Yes, we're living in the time of the end. Now, that's a question that requires a lot of time to really fully answer. But if you study Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, you will quickly realize that we are indeed living in the time of the end. And it is a very serious time because Christ is soon to come. And when Christ comes, he's not coming to provide additional probation within which people can make decisions to obey him. When Christ comes, he is not coming as a priest. He is coming as a king. In the Jewish system, the priest, when he functioned, he wore a mitre on his head. You read that in Leviticus 16, verse 4. When Christ comes, he is not wearing a mitre, he's wearing a crown. Revelation 14, verse 14. The crown suggests he's coming as a conquering king. When Christ comes, there's no more opportunity to repent. Many churches teach when he comes, there'll be some time to repent. That is absolutely destructive teaching. When Jesus Christ comes back, he's coming back because his work of saving people has been finished. And so he comes back to destroy his enemies and take his people with him. Yes, we are living in the end of time, and my appeal to you is to consider this. Our present life is about this long. That's it. Eternal life is this. If this is all this life is, and this is eternal life, where should your emphasis be? On this or on this? Common sense should tell us my focus should be preparing for this, not necessarily ignoring this, but prioritizing this. We are living in the end time, and the final events that literally bring Christ down from heaven will be rapid, they will be sudden, they will be catastrophic, but they will come. And if we're not prepared day by day, when those events occur, we will never be prepared. We are living in the last days, and Christ is soon to come. My listening friend, Get ready for his coming. And when I say get ready, continually surrender to him that he might make you ready for his return. But yes, we're living absolutely in the last days. The next question kind of goes back to the issue of death. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a threefold question. The, the first part of that is, what does the Bible say mm -hmm. about committing suicide? Mm -hmm. uh, can a person be saved if they commit suicide, mm -hmm. and more specifically, will a believer, a Christian who commits suicide be saved? That's a, a delicate question. Your life does not belong to you. First Corinthians 6, 19, 20, ye are bought with a price, ye are not your own. No one is authorized to take his or her life. People say, well, look at Samson. Samson did not take his life. Samson sacrificed his life. Those are two different things. When soldiers go to war, they are not committing suicide. They are sacrificing themselves. Jesus Christ did not commit suicide, but he laid down his own life. He tells us in John chapter 10, verse 18, no man taketh it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. Christ sacrificed himself. That was not suicide. Suicide is a crime against God and against mankind. Christ did not commit suicide, he sacrificed his life. Samson did not commit suicide, Samson sacrificed his life. You read the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to 24. Paul knew that by going to Jerusalem, he would die, but he went because he had been given a mission from God. That was not suicide, that is a willingness to sacrifice the life for the cause of God. The three Hebrew boys willingly went into the burning fiery furnace. Why do I say willingly? The men taking them fell down dead. So they must have walked into that furnace. That was not suicide. We know that God saved them, but had he not saved them, it would not have been suicide. Let me tell you again, your life does not belong to you. It belongs to God. And to commit suicide is to deliberately, knowingly, intentionally take from God what is his. So I do not see how someone who deliberately commits suicide can be saved. Notice I said, I don't see how, and I don't claim to know everything. Let me say again, Christ did not commit suicide. 
He gave up his life for the glory of the Father. Samson did not commit suicide. He gave up his life for the glory of the purpose of his God, the God of the Israelites. Samson is in Hebrews 11 in the hall of faith. And so he will be saved. Suicide is taking the life not for the glory of God, but for one's own purposes. And so all I can say is I do not see how someone who commits suicide can be saved. I just don't see how. That's the limit of my wisdom on that question. There are many books out there in the world. And how do I know if the Bible is the only book that I should use for a, a source of inspiration and guidance? Mm -hmm. uh, can I use other books for my inspiration and my guidance? I like that question. As Christians, we ought not to be narrow-minded. God has not given all wisdom only to Christians. There are some non-Christians to whom God has seen fit to reveal information that the Christian may not have. Let me use this example. The Bible is a, Bible of, is a book of prophecy. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, of which I'm a member, it is founded on prophecy and the prophetic statement that's the cornerstone of our religion or our teaching is Daniel 8, 14. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. But if you take a prophecy as occurs in Daniel 2, Daniel saw an image, the head of gold, the belly and thighs, the belly, the breast and arms of silver, the belly of, uh, of uh, legs, uh, of the belly of um, brass and the legs of iron. They represented nations, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. You've got to go to secular history to establish the accuracy of that. If you go to Daniel 8, we have the, the goat with a notable horn. We have the ram, the battle between the ram and the, and the goat. The goat destroys the ram. That's Greece destroying the Persians, which actually happened. But you've got to go to secular history to determine that. And so prophecy, which is history spoken in advance, you must study secular history so that you can see the accuracy of Bible prophecy. I am saying all of that to say, yes, there is some factual information to be found outside of the Bible, yes. But in general, saving truth is found here. Let me say it again. There is truth, which means something is factual. Tuesday comes before Wednesday. That is a fact. That is true. That is not saving truth. Are you following me? Rain falls down, it does not fall up. That is true. That is not saving truth. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That is saving truth. Saving truth is found in the word of God. That is why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And by the way, when he said that, he was referring to the Ten Commandments. I don't have the time to show that to you. But when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, he was actually referring to the Ten Commandments as the way of life. God has revealed information to a lot of people, a lot of scientists, to archaeologists, and that information has supported the fact that the Bible is the Word of God. But if you want saving truth, if you want truth that sanctifies, and according to 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, the truth that does that is the truth that is found in the pages of this book called the Holy Bible, and I recommend that book to you with all my heart and soul. It will change your life. It will change your thinking. It will change your children. It will improve your health because the Word of God, the truth of God, is life. And the Bible also reveals in His Word, in the Word, that the first miracle of Christ was that He changed water into wine mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in that wedding. So the question is, 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 is it then okay for a Christian to drink wine? <laughs> the word wine has a certain emotional effect, you see. We think of alcohol. The juice of the grape is referred to in the Bible as wine. Grape juice is wine. But when we hear wine, we hear intoxicating beverage. God cannot talk from both sides of his mouth. If you study the Bible carefully, the very first reference to wine is in Genesis 9. And Noah planted a vine began to be a husband man, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken in his tent. Now, this is our introduction to alcohol, you see. He became drunk. His younger son did something to him. Does not explain in the Bible. And Noah cursed him. We know that story. 
The, th the second introduction to wine is in Genesis 14, where Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. He was a priest of the Most High God. The third introduction to wine is Genesis 19, where Lot's two daughters gave him wine to drink, made him drunk. Grape juice does not make you drunk. That is what the Bible condemns, intoxicating beverages, not grape juice. Jesus Christ, who is God, Jesus Christ, who is the Word, cannot condemn intoxicating beverages and then give it to people. He does not do that because the Bible calls us to live what we preach. And so where you read wine that's intoxicating, we're referring to alcohol. But the one that Christ made when he converted water into wine was not intoxicating beverage. It was the fruit, the juice of the grape, which was grape juice, not something that makes you drunk. God does not sanction alcoholic intoxicating beverages. He does not do that because we're not to defile this body. When wine was offered to Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, in Daniel 1, they refused it because they did not want to defile their bodies. Then that wine was alcohol. Grape juice does not defile alcohol defiles. So when you see wine in the Bible, you've got to be careful. Is it referring to the intoxicating beverage or is it referring to the juice of the grape? What God recommends is the juice of the grape. The next question has to do with marriage mm -hmm. and actually in this case divorce. Mm -hmm. And the question is, should a person be allowed to divorce another in the case of abuse, whether mm -hmm. it be physical, mental, or emotional mm -hmm. and another part of that is why does the Bible only really outline adultery as the reason that a person can divorce okay it's a serious question and a sensitive one marriage is an extremely serious choice people get in and out of marriages as though it's a recreational activity marriage is serious business uh, from God's viewpoint, once you're in, you're in. But God allows one clear cause for divorce, and that is adultery. One clear cause for divorce, adultery. Now, churches may give you other avenues to divorce. The Bible gives one clear reason for divorce, that is adultery, where you've broken that contract between you and the, the other person. Now, there are causes for separation. But separation is not divorce. There are causes for separation. Now, if a woman or a man is being abused, the person may choose to separate after having done what he or she could do to heal that situation. The Bible tells us in Romans 12, verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, including your spouse who is acting up. If that concentrated effort fails, you may separate, but the reason for divorce is adultery. And this may sound harsh, but this is biblical. And so let me say again, before you get into marriage, please keep in mind, once you're in biblically, you are in. And the only clear cause for divorce is adultery. Now, the question is, why would God only give that? I don't know. That's the only one God gives. As a matter of fact, when we leave God, he calls that adultery spiritual adultery or spiritual fornication. And so he applies it at the social level. Adultery is the clear, and I keep saying the clear biblical foundation for separation or divorce. But even then, he, uh, Malachi chapter two, verse 16, God does not like divorce, you see. He prefers reconciliation. That's why there's a cross of Calvary to bring about reconciliation between God and the people who divorce him, that is sinners. When God drove Adam out of the garden, the Hebrew word technically means divorce, but he sent Christ to bring him back. And so divorce is allowed based on adultery, the clear Bible, justi Bible justification. Separation is allowed. If a woman is being beaten up or a man, separation is fine. But keep in mind, separation does not free you to remarry. Separation is not divorce. Adultery is the clear Bible reason for divorce. The next question is, is it a sin to worry? Very carefully, I'll say this. If God tells me, don't do something, and I do it, 
I have sinned. The Bible tells us over and over, don't worry, don't fear, take no thought for the morrow. To worry is to tell God, I am questioning your ability to handle a situation. Understand this about God. God put everything in place before he made Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve opened their eyes, they had water, they had food, they had shelter, they had the right environment, they had a companionship of animals and one another. They had everything necessary for a blessed life. That's the way God functions. So we learn from Genesis 1, the creation story, that our God puts things in place. All we need to do is obey him. When God brought the Israelites into the wilderness, he deliberately took them into the wilderness. One reason was to show them he can take care of them. Jesus says, take no thought for the morrow. The reason why we worry, I believe, fundamentally, is that from time to time, we remove God from position one in our lives. And when God is no longer in position one, whatever is in position one then becomes a temporary source of sustenance, and then we have to worry because we realize that thing is not sufficient. When God stays as number one, then it gives us the courage we need, even though we cannot see the way out. When in John chapter six, Jesus told Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? The feeding of the 5,000. Now, Philip had no clue what he would do, but the Bible says Jesus knew what he would do. Christ already had the answer, but he tested Philip and the other disciples. We serve a God who has all our needs covered, whether we can see that or not. Not. And so to worry is in a certain sense to question God, but a relationship with God is a growth. Second Peter chapter three, verse 18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we get to know God through study of the word and obedience of the word, as we learn of God, we worry less and less and less because it is a growing process. But nowhere in the Bible are we told to worry. We're told not to worry. And so in that sense, worrying is a sin. But God understands we're weak and the Lord takes us along step by step. But if your focus is God, the God who made heaven and earth, the God who made trees for food, he made water to drink. The God who did that can take care of me. The problem is, am I fully surrendered to God? And if I'm totally surrendered to God, my problems become his problems. Little children don't worry. They leave that to the parents. We must have that attitude with God. How about the next question? Mm -hmm. Is once saved, always saved truly biblical? It is absolutely not biblical. Go ahead. And can a Christian uh, lose his salvation? Yes, a Christian can lose his salvation right from the mouth of Jesus Christ himself. John 17, verse 12, Jesus said in a prayer, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those whom thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said Judas was lost, and Judas was chosen by Christ. He was one of the 12. When Christ gave them power to cast out devils and do miracles, Judas was included, but Judas was lost. Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. Demas used to work with Paul. Then he left Paul and went off into the world. There is no such thing in the Bible as once saved, always saved. You can be saved and decide at some point to leave God. This was the case with Judas. This was the case with Demas. Not everyone who comes to God stays with God. In John chapter 6, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were lost. They were with him, then they left him. The Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. Now, it's attractive to the carnal nature because if I say I come to Jesus today, Thursday, he saves me, then I cannot be lost. So I go to the bar, go to the casino, go to the whorehouse, go to the drug den, I cannot be lost, you see. So it comforts the sinner, the one who loves to practice sin, to believe, once saved, always saved. But no, 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 no. When you're saved, you've got to hold on to Jesus to preserve that state of, justi of being justified. The Bible talks about sanctification, continual growth, a saved person, can decide to leave God. There are biblical examples, once saved, 
always say is a satanic doctrine. Let me repeat my words. It is a satanic doctrine. It is not in the Bible. You know, Adam, we read in, the, in Genesis that Adam sinned. Mm -hmm. So if Adam sinned, mm -hmm. why is God concerned about the rest of Adam's children, mm -hmm. us, the rest of his family? Why should we have to be involved in this? doesn't seem fair. If Adam sinned, then it should be between God and Adam. Why is it also affecting us? Mm -hmm. No one is born guilty of Adam's sin. You're responsible, for the sin, you're responsible for the sins you commit, you see. The son shall not perish for the father's sins or the father for the son's sins. We are born in a condition that requires a savior. Let me say it differently. Everyone born into the world of Adam is born needing a savior. No one is born guilty of Adam's sin because none of us chose to commit his sin. But... The way God set up the system, the behavior of one can affect others. Now, when Jesus Christ died, who is the second Adam, he provided a covering for every person who's ever been born, and that is called probation. It was the blood of Christ that prevented Adam from dying immediately. It was the blood of Christ because he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let me say again, when Christ died, his blood Cover the entire world like the morning and evening sacrifice in the days of the Old Testament, you see. Now, that covering didn't mean salvation from sin. It meant a temporary protection from destruction, from condemnation, within which period you can come to him and be justified. Let me say that again differently. When Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from God, they were lost. They were lost. Christ came to save them, but they were lost with hope. And that hope was because of the blood of Christ. When Jesus said to Zacchaeus, the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, that seeking began in Eden. He came to seek Adam and Eve to save them. Remember, they were hiding from him. No saved person hides from God. So Adam and Eve were lost, but they were lost under the hope of the blood of Christ. And so they came and the father of Christ saved them by covering them with the coats of skin. The sin of Adam gave to us a nature that leans towards sin. We have to be saved from that. So everyone born of Adam and Eve comes into the world needing a savior, but not guilty of Adam's sin. Let me say that clearly. That's original sin. Well, the Bible does not teach that. But you were born in need of a savior. The only person who was not born in need of a savior was the savior himself, Jesus Christ. That is the part of the mystery of the incarnation, Christ becoming human. And so God does not hold me guilty for what Adam did. God holds me responsible for the choices I make. Thank you, Elder Skeet. My pleasure entirely. These, these are the last of our, the questions that we have mm -hmm. for today. Mm -hmm. um, could you wrap this up and yes. address um, our audience? Mm -hmm. what, what, if they have other questions, where should they go for their source of, of answers? My friend, wherever you are, if you have a Bible question, go to the Bible. The Bible is a source of unerring truth. When Christ was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, in Matthew's version, Matthew 4 verse 4, Christ said to the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. In Psalm 119 verse 105, the Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God tells us how to live. In many ways, the Bible is a how-to book how to raise your children, how to manage your finances, how to conquer sin, how to prepare for the life to come, how to detect error, how to whatever. The Bible is a manual of how to live a life that pleases God. And so if you have questions now, let me also say, there are some people who are blessed by God with Bible knowledge. And yes, you may talk to them. It may be your pastor. It may be whomever. But that does not remove from you the serious responsibility 
ability to make an attempt to understand the word of God. Because Jesus gave you a promise in John 16 verse 13. How be it when he the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. I want you to believe that if you take your Bible in your hand and you say, Father, teach me, guide me, God will do that. But there are conditions for understanding the word of God. Condition one, get rid of sin. Sin creates static that blocks the transmission of truth from heaven. Two, you must be willing to obey what you learn. John 7 verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. A willingness to obey is essential for God to reveal truth. David prayed in Psalm 119 verse 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Ask God to explain the word to you. Make an effort to study. Confess your sins and ask the Holy Spirit of God to guide you. Never, never give up the privilege of studying the Bible for yourself. Because when you study the Bible, you are fellowshipping with Father, Son, Holy Ghost and angels. Why do I say that? In the book of Acts chapter 8. An angel told Philip to go down the road that led to a certain direction. Then Philip began to walk that road. When Philip got near to the chariot, the Holy Spirit told him, go up to the chariot. And so we have two heavenly beings. The angel told him the road to take. The Spirit told him, go up to the chariot. And so we have the Spirit and the angel involved in a teaching experience with Philip taught the Ethiopian eunuch. And so when you study the word of God, Jesus says, I am the truth. The Father is truth, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. The Holy Spirit is truth, 1 John 5 verse 6. When you study the word of God, you are fellowshipping with Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and angels. When Daniel was given a vision in Daniel chapter 8 verse 16, the Bible says, Daniel heard a voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Gabriel was commanded by God to help Daniel understand. When you study the Bible, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and angels are all involved in that activity. And so I urge you, yes, there may be some things you won't understand. You may need to ask your pastor, but never, never absolutely surrender the privilege of Bible study because Bible study is fellowship with the family of heaven. And if your desire is to know what is true, God will reveal it, and when he does, obey him. May the Lord bless you and put a double blessing on your children. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Ski. My pleasure. We appreciate you being here mm -hmm. and answering all these questions. All right. And uh, we look forward to uh, doing this again in the future. May God bless you, and thank you for watching. The promise is all. It stands as the sun. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast till I come.